Hi everybody and welcome back to the last episode for Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. I just finished chapter 18. By the way, if you didn't know somehow, this is There I Read It and I'm your hostess McGann and I am reading Harry Potter for the first time in my life, which has been a very crazy kind of journey here. And as expected, chapter 17 was really the bulk of the action, really the climax of the story. And now this is sort of the explanation and coming down, winding down, getting ready to end. So at the end of the last chapter everybody is going into McGarnagle's office and once they open the door Mr. and Mrs. Weasley are already in there and they're just crying. And I guess that sort of answers the question I had as to whether or not Hogwarts was telling the parents that their children were getting petrified or going missing. Um, but I suppose in Ginny's case they really didn't have a choice because it was expected that she was going to die. Whereas the other students were only petrified which made them statue-like and that was something that they could eventually solve at Hogwarts. So I still kind of feel like all of these muggle-born children did not have their parents notified that they have been petrified for months. And in McGarnagle's office they find that Professor Dumbledore is back. And while Harry is explaining the story of what happened to everybody, Dumbledore goes, well I wonder how Lord Voldemort was able to curse Jenny or you know take control of Jenny when my sources say that he's in the forests of Albania hiding. So then Harry had to explain that Tom Riddle and the diary were a thing and how Tom Riddle used to be a student and then later became Lord Voldemort through all this dark magic stuff that he practiced. And Dumbledore admits that Tom Riddle was probably the most brilliant student that Hogwarts had ever seen. And when the Weasleys hear about the whole diary issue and how that took over Jenny, Arthur is like, oh my gosh, Jenny, haven't I taught you any Anything, and you can never trust anything that can think for itself if you can't see where it keeps its brain. I thought that was very good sound curious advice. And Jenny explains that she found the diary inside of one of the books that her mother gave her in Diagon Alley. And at first I thought, no, surely not Lockhart. Lockhart wouldn't have slipped that into the books he gave Harry for some reason. That just doesn't seem to track. Although I guess if Lockhart had been evil, he would be a lot harder to expect because he's already a bumbling dolt. Anyways though, we'll get to the diary mystery in a minute. The mandrake juice is now ready and has been given to all the petrified students. They expect to see no lasting damages. And Dumbledore says, hey Minerva, which is McGarnagle's first name, I think we need to have a feast. So will you go alert the kitchen? And I'm just like, wait, kitchen? People are actually cooking for this school? The food isn't just magicked in front of them? Oh my gosh, these poor, poor, poor servant people. And with most of the people out of the room, Lockhart gets sent to see Madame Pomfrey so that he can try to get his memory back. Although I kind of wonder how hard they're going to try to get it back. And Dumbledore says that Ron and Harry will both get a special award for services to the school and 200 points each for Gryffindor. Dumbledore also says that he needs to thank Harry because Fox would have only come to him if he were truly loyal to Dumbledore. Dumbledore then reveals that Fox only came to Harry to kind of bask in Harry's loyalty to Dumbledore, which it's kind of strange. That's not what I thought he meant when he described a phoenix as being a very loyal companion, that the phoenix is like, hold on, I hear somebody somewhere talking about you, Dumzy. Let me go sing their praises and treasure them. And it turns out that Harry can speak Parseltongue because Voldemort transferred some of his power over to him when he tried to kill Harry. And it's a total accident. It's not something that Voldemort intended to do, but it's just sort of a residual effect. And Harry's response is, Voldemort put a piece of himself in me? And not only do I think that that's going to come back later, I have a good idea from vaguely what I can recall from all the movies, but just the phrasing of that, Voldemort put a bit of himself in me. This is a children's book, madam. How could you write something like that? Phrasing. Harry was just a baby. He couldn't consent. Ugh. Moving along. The sword that Harry had a hold of actually has the words Godric Gryffindor inscribed in it. 
So when Harry's having this sort of crisis of, but the Sorting Hat thought I should go into Slytherin, Dumbledore's like, oh yeah, well only a true Gryffindor could have gotten that sword out of that Sorting Hat. So quit questioning the hat, Harry. This is a very flimsy device. Don't poke holes in it. Although having just seen the Owl House, I have to say I'm a bigger fan of the choosy hat that eats the students' heads. But anyhow, Dumbledore is going to now write to Azkaban to get Hagrid back, which he shows back up at about three in the morning. And Dumbledore also has to write the Daily Prophet to make an ad for a new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher since they can't seem to keep one in stock. Then angrily, Lucius Lucius Malfoy bursts into the room and he wants to know why Dumbledore reinstated himself without permission. And Dumbledore says that 11 of the 12 governors had written him when Jenny Weasley went missing and they wanted Dumbledore to come back. And several of those governors said that Lucius Malfoy threatened to curse their families if they didn't vote to remove Dumbledore the first time. So Lucius is kind of standing there and he knows Dumbledore has him dead to rights, but he's not going to admit to anything willingly. And it comes out that Harry and Dumbledore have both pieced it together that Lucius Malfoy had slipped the diary into Ginny's books and that is probably why Lucius made that big scuffle at the bookstore and you know got into that big fight with Arthur said those things about muggles and, and really ticked him off so that way he'd have an excuse to slip that little diary into Ginny's books and, and it not really be detected with all the other commotion. Although actually now that I said that maybe Lucius picked up one of Ginny's books and skimmed over it beforehand I, I can't quite remember. I've already forgotten. But to be fair, it's been like three months that I've been reading this book. So what happened in chapter, what, three, four is not really as fresh in my memory as it was. So forgive me if I'm mistaken. But I like the idea of a fight better. It shows an extra layer of, oh, I'm gonna get these guys at any cost. Like a, another level of dedication from Lucius Malfoy. But it seems that Lucius's entire goal was to get Ginny in trouble, not just for the sake of of, you know, the diary coming back to life or the basilisk hurting people, but more so to go after Arthur Weasley and to kill his Muggle Protection Act. So again, we're seeing some politics in the wizarding world, even though it's, it's really kind of a more subtle backwards kind of way to it. You would think that if Lucius Malfoy is this dark arts kind of dude who's a Voldemort supporter, then bringing Voldemort back through the diary would be his goal more than the Muggle Protection Act. But maybe it was just a serendipitous bit of gravy that he found the Weasley in Diagon Alley and so he he went for that target. But Malfoy leaves in a huff and Harry decides to chase him down and give him the diary back which Harry puts his nasty slimy bloody sock on top of it and Lucius sees that and goes, ugh, throws it to the side. Guess who catches it? Dobby! Dobby gets himself a sock. And while Lucius is leaving, he's like, come on, Dobby. And Dobby's like, no, Dobby is free boy now. Dobby got sock. You threw it. I caught it. Even though you never intended to free me, loopholes are all that matter here. They're binding. And so Malfoy's like, oh, I I'm going to get you now, Potter. And Dobby steps in and, and wandless. Dobby is just so powerful. He he throws Lucius Malfoy down the stairs and tells him, you know, get out of here. You're not touching my boy, Harry Potter. And Lucius does so with a little huff, but of course it's not going to be the last we hear from him. I'm sure he'll be back soon. And now Dobby is elated. He just poofs himself away and Harry goes to the feast where Hermione's there and Hagrid eventually comes back and all this wonderful good stuff is happening. Gryffindor wins the house cup because of that 400 points that Ron and Harry just got. And then Lucius Malfoy ends up being fired. So he is no longer a governor for Hogwarts. Uh, so at, at least in that regard, he's not a threat anymore. And while on the train for summer break, they're finally like, okay, Jenny, tell us what you saw Percy doing that, that he was so embarrassed about. And she's like, oh, Percy has a girlfriend. That's why he's been writing all these letters and sneaking around and it's Penelope Clearwater, the Ravenclaw girl that got petrified. So that's why Percy was so upset. It wasn't just because, well, she was a prefect and prefects are untouchable and how could they? Then, you know, this rocked my whole world. I'm broken now. It was really because Percy had a girlfriend. 
Although I don't know why he wouldn't come out and say that if it's actually his girlfriend and they're dating and they're they're kissing. And that was actually the thing that Jenny walked in on was that Percy and Penelope were making out in an empty classroom. And I don't know, maybe they were supposed to be on guard doing something else. So that's why Percy didn't want Jenny to spill those beans. But yeah, I, I don't see why he'd want to hide that. Most guys would be like, yes, I have a girlfriend, finally, yay. But then again, knowing Fred and George, maybe uh, Percy wanted to keep that secret under his hat as long as possible. Is Percy a sixth year or a seventh year though? Because I feel like he should have graduated, but they made no mention on that regard. And then Harry gives Ron and Hermione his phone number this time instead of just, you know, send an owl kind of thing. And Harry's like, listen, Ron, I already told your dad how phones work. So you call me this summer and you too, Hermione. I don't want to just have Dudley to talk to for the entire summer. And I, I kind of wonder how that's going to work because as soon as Harry comes home, aren't they going to lock him back up again? And if not, they definitely know at this point that Harry can't do magic outside of the school. So what is to force the Dursleys to allow Harry to use their phone? I don't know. I guess we'll have to start chapter one of the next book to find out. And in the last few sentences of the book, Hermione's kind of like, well, wait, the Dursleys will surely be proud of you when they've heard all the good things that you've done. And Harry's like, oh, you mean how I had all these chances to die, but I didn't? No, they're going to be mad about that. And I don't know, maybe they will, but if you never make an attempt to let them in, I guess they'll never get in. But I, I don't know, I do have an evolving opinion about the Dursleys, so I'm curious to see how the start of the next book is going to work out. I still feel like they have a lot of story that's not told, but I also definitely feel like it was maybe abuse or borderline abuse or debatable abuse in the first book. It, it definitely crosses way into the abuse line at the end end of the Dursleys part in the second book. So I, I, yeah, I'm just, I'm confused why Harry goes back there, why he doesn't go back with the Weasleys, why the school lets him go back there, doesn't give him an option to stay behind like Tom Riddle had apparently gotten, and what Harry is honestly expecting to happen since he broke their window and ran away against their wishes. This homecoming, for lack of a better word, it's going to be the worst yet, I can only imagine. But um, yes, other than that, book is all completed. I'm probably going to take another few weeks off, just sort of absorb everything and then start on book three, Prisoner of Azkaban, which apparently is not going to be Hagrid because Hagrid is already out of Azkaban. But other than the fact that I just could not stay in that movie, it was so slow and trudgy, I really don't know what to expect from it. I, I can't remember a whole lot about it. I remember all the kids seemed to be wearing normal clothes way too much in that movie and I hated it, but I guess we'll see soon. So anyways, thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and check back for more videos soon. And we will see you next time, family members. Well, family members, we're almost done, but I want to invite you to hang out with me in some other places. I'm on Twitter and Instagram as my own personal self. And I have a Facebook page too, but I mostly just post photos over there. And sometimes people say, hey, McGann, I want to mail you something. How do I do that? Easy. Just click the about tab on my channel page and my most current PO box info will be right there. I also run another channel, The Family. It's really a hodgepodge channel where we might post anything. Oh yeah, and I also sell shirts and stickers and stuff with the family and the fangirl logos. If that is your cup of tea, I have a link in every description of every video. Finally, if you want to help out the fangirl channel and make sure I'm putting out video essays for years to come, the best way you can help is by subscribing and watching more of my videos, whether they're new, old, whatever. Maybe even share one or two on social media, help spread the word. People who watch to the end of videos like you helps to tell the site, hey, this is a good video. We should recommend it to other people. So if you made it this far, leave me a comment of something like, hey, I made it to the end. Love ya. See you next time, family members. Bye.